Okay, okay. the audio is good, the video is good too. <clears throat> so I wanted to, the class to understand what is $2.1 trillion. Okay, you know, because to us, it's just a number, right? You know, it's 2.1 trillion, so what is exactly 2.1 trillion dollars? So I did some research. I found that, you know, on the average, uh, a supercarrier task force group of the United States has a price tag of $30 billion and would cost about $100 million in terms of personnel, paying the people to run the ship and the airplanes and whatnot. So, okay, so, <clears throat> so if we translate that, okay, into the $2.1 trillion, which is how much NVIDIA is worth right now, how many supercarrier task force group can it run? So 30 billion for each you know, group, and NVIDIA is worth $2.1 trillion. Hmm? 70, yes, 70, seven, zero, yes. And the United States as a country has 11 of those groups right now. That kind of gives you a sense of you know, what is $2.1 trillion. It is a huge amount of money. 10 Elon Musks can try to pull their money together and they cannot afford to buy Nvidia. Is that, is that kind of giving you guys you know, an idea of how hot you know, that company is right now? <clears throat> which also should kind of, you, you should be asking the question, why is it so hot, right? You know, there are a lot of tech companies, Microsoft, Google, IBM, you know, those are all very established, you know, you know, tech companies, and they're all trying to do AI research, but you cannot do AI, at least a certain kind of re AI research and run the AI, you know, surface without the hardware to run the software, to run the neural nets. And NVIDIA, basically, right now, it has a chokehold on the entire industry because you know, right now, they are the ones producing the neural network you know, chip for everybody else to use. So that's a, it's just kind of interesting, okay? I just wanted to share this with you because I find it you know, to be quite interesting. <clears throat> All right, so getting back to what we were talking about before, so today's focus is going to be on continuing on to stuff that we talked about before. So we are going back to the agreement, the mutual agreement between the caller, which is the code making the call to the function, and the callee, which is the function being called. So we are done with a lot of these topics already from, yes, uh, from last, uh, from this Tuesday. So the only thing we haven't really talked about are the local variables. And you can see that the local variables do not appear anywhere on the caller side. In other words, the local variables of a function is the entire responsibility of the function being called. There's nothing that a caller has to do for local variables. Everything that you have to do with local variables have to do with the callee or the function being called. <clears throat> So when you look at the callee side, there are quite a few things that it, it has to do. So the first thing, okay, I can apologize because I think, there we go. So on the callee side, additional stack space may be utilized for local variables. And then if you do use local variables, then you have to deallocate the local variables on the callee side. So that's kind of what we will be talking about today is how do we use local variables in assembly language code. But before we start on that one, do we have any questions about the lab before or the topics that we have already talked about, all the stuff that we have talked about already in previous lectures? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, I'm going to proceed with the sample program that I'll be using to talk about local variables. So let me pull my command line interface into view and we'll choose, say, this prompt here. 
So just like last time, I'm going to give you the C code and also implement in assembly code so that you can see the code side by side. <clears throat> and this is going to be increment, and I think it's lowercase o, increment.c and increment.ttpasm. <clears throat> no, the, the wrong case, it should be uppercase. There we go. So as usual, I have pound include standard integer.h just so that I can emphasize the return type is an 8-bit integer and not just a wide integer because I want to make the C code to be as close as possible to the assembly code. So u in 8 underscore t <clears throat> increment. And increment is going to take a pointer to a 8-bit integer in this case because we need to change whatever it's pointing to. So inside we have a local variable. We'll call this old value. And an old value is going to get whatever p is pointing to. And then we're going to increment whatever p is pointing to. So we're going to have you know, plus plus whatever p is pointing to. And then we return old value as the return value. So this increment, which is the same thing as post increment in C++ as an operator, is basically returning the value that whatever p is pointing to before the increment. But it will also have the side effect of incrementing whatever p is pointing to. So therefore, this increment function is really doing the same thing as you know, whatever you know, integer variable plus plus. So are we okay with that concept? Are we associating that concept with the post increment operator in C++? <clears throat> All right, so with that in mind, well, we are going to go into main. So this time, main is going to have local variables. So we'll have you know, a local variable called, well, I'll just call it x here. And we'll have another one called y. Why not? <clears throat> x is going to be uh, initialized to a 5. And then we'll say y equals to the um, return value of increment. And because you know, we are expecting an address to an uin8 underscore t, so now we have to pass the address of x and not just x here, and then return 0. All right, so this is the C code that I want to translate into assembly code today. Before we do any translation, do we have any questions about the C code itself? Because if we don't understand what the C code is supposed to do, then the entire discussion is pointless. So I will kind of pause here and see if there are any questions about the C code. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. It is set to whatever the pointer points to. It does not affect old value. Old value is a snapshot of the value that p is pointing to prior to the increment. That is correct. Old value is the non-incremented copy of the value that p used to point to. Yes. Yes. Effectively, on line 28, is it, no, 18, it is the same thing as y equals x plus plus. It is post increment. Post increment because I'm, I'm returning the value of increment of inc, inc, is the value before the increment. And therefore, this is a post increment operation because in the post increment operator, which is you know, y plus plus, the expression returns the value of y prior to the actual increment. It just has the quote unquote side effect of incrementing the value of y. But that is never used as the return value of the expression itself. Okay? All right. So, but before we try to implement the assembly code, it is important to test this one first. So let's go ahead and test this code. 
just to make sure that it does what we think it should be doing. So we will have this code like this, gdb increment, uh, list the program, okay? That's really not much to you know, talk about here. So we're gonna put a breakpoint on line 18 just so that we can kind of check a few things before calling ink. And then when we are in ink, we can also check a few things, okay? So do we have any questions? Nope, okay, all right. So we're gonna run the program. Now we're on line 18. So we can print the value of x, which is five, okay? That's not really a surprising. So now we single step into ink. So the first thing you might notice is when we call ink, the parameter p is not a unsigned a-bit integer. It is the address of an unsigned a-bit integer. Okay, is that okay? Are we clear on that one? <clears throat> the value that it points to is a five. So the reason why the five looks kind of funky is because your know, five as an a-bit integer can also be seen as a character with an ASCII code of five. So in, the, in GDB as a debugger, when it thinks that it's dealing with a character, it would use the character way of showing the value. And because five, as ASCII code five is a control character, it typically has no equivalent printable character corresponding to it. So the debugger is using the octo method to express that this is ASCII code five. So it's an octo number, which means you know, five of one, zero of eight, and zero of 64. Yes? Let's go ahead and check that first, okay? That's a very good idea. So we are gonna check whether P as a parameter, so because you can always say, just say print P, it is an address that ends with one E in hexadecimal. So we want to know, is that really the address of variable X in um, the main program, right? The main function. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can say, okay, tell me what is the address of X. It's not gonna work because we are currently in the context of ink as a function. Ink itself does not have a parameter named X. It does not have a local variable named X. There's no global variable named X. So from the context of the current scope, there's no X. So now you have to go like, okay, so how do we convince the debugger to switch to the context of main and show us the address of variable x in main. So this technique is really useful, I think. You know, personally, I like it, and I find it to be really useful. Um, not only in this class, also in your other classes, especially in recursive functions. So if you have not taken CISP 430, you have not written a lot of recursive functions, this technique can really help save you a lot of time. So the, there are two pieces to it. The first piece is called BT, which is also backtrace. So backtrace gives you a view of how we got to ink. So it shows that in main, on line 18, it called ink. And then ink is here, and these are the, this, is the, this is the parameter of ink. So it also shows you, you know, two numbers. Pound zero is what is known as frame zero. Frame zero is always the quote unquote current frame. Okay, if I don't change the frame, this is the current context, which is ink. Frame one is the caller of this function. So now I can refer to, oh, frame zero is the current context, but if I want to, I now have, a, have the ability to designate a prior frame and say, let's switch to the prior frame and figure out what is going on in the prior frame. So the second command that is really useful is called frame. And then you just give it the number of the frame. So now I can switch the context of the debugger from ink back to main, just like that. So now you can ask what is y, what is x, and so on. So now you can say, what is x? Okay, x has a value of five. What is the address of x? Ah, that seems to be the same as the 
parameter of parameter p of inc because that's exactly what we passed. We passed the address of local variable x of main as parameter p of inc. Is that okay so far? Okay, so this is a pretty useful technique when you're debugging a program, especially when there are multiple ways to get to a function in your program, because the BT method will show you exactly the path by which you get to a specific function. All right, so, okay, so if I need to go back to frame zero, I just have to say frame zero, and now we are back to ink. So now the first thing is uh, to execute you know, line seven, and then I check what is old value. I think it should be five, okay? Because that's exactly what P is pointing to. Well, sure enough, it is just five. And now we are ready to execute line eight, which is incrementing whatever P is pointing to. Single step, doesn't show us anything, right? So if you are curious of, hey, so I think by this time, variable x of main should be six, okay? Then you will be correct. But just because you think it is happening doesn't mean it is actually happening. So it is helpful to use the debugger to observe that it has happened already. So we're gonna do that trick again. Frame one, so that I can switch back to the main context. Print x, it is now a six. Does everybody understand what just happened? What the debugger is illustrating? Yes. You can query. So when you, when you switch to a frame, then the debugger has access to all the local variables as well as parameters within that frame. So that's, that's really helpful because now you can query a bunch of stuff. It's like, how did you get this value over here? How did you get that value over here? You can also look for side effect, just like you know, what we're doing here. How is the function being called changing something of the caller, which is exactly what's happening here because I passed the address of a local variable to a function. So now the function has a way to change something of the caller. Okay, all right. So we switch back to frame zero again, you know, just you know, do a single step. But before we do the single step, we just want to double check. We, I've checked already earlier, but we just want to double check what it is returning. Old value is five, okay? So now a single step and switch all the way back to main. So now I can print, okay, what, what did y get? y got five. What is x? x is now six. So are we doing okay so far with the C code based on, you know, just basically concepts from CISP 360? Are we, all, are we all okay with this? Okay, all right. So now we can get out of the debugger and then look into how do we do this in assembly. So now we switch to the assembly code. The, as usual, there's a no op but I will differ from the earlier classes a little bit now. I'm gonna treat main as a real function. In other words, I'm gonna call main from here, okay? And I'm gonna change the way I call main just a little bit. It will look extremely awkward for a moment, but I'll explain it. LDIA with dot six plus, and then document D, S, T, D, A, and then JMPI to main, when it comes back, we have a halt. And here's main. All right. So you can see that you know, where we used to have a label of main returns here, that is not a label anymore. We are not defining a label. And instead, we have this kind of really cryptic expression of dot six plus. So the question is, what, is, what does that mean, okay? So there are two things that are really important. One is what is the dot representing, and two is what kind of expression are we looking at. Has anyone looked into the assembler manual? All right, that's okay. We can go over that together. <laughs> so let me find it first, okay? It's in my drive, so we'll go to my drive. Go to CISP 310. 
So I highly recommend after today's lecture that you guys go to that document and read the appropriate section that talks about you know, both of these topics. All right, so we go to processor and then the assembler manual is right here. All right, so the first thing is label definition. So right here, it says you know, a label definition can also utilize a postfix expression. So right here, I just want to highlight it. Okay, there we go. So what exactly is a postfix expression? Okay, and you know how does it relate to the usual things that we do, which is called infix notation? So the postfix notation is simply saying, don't put the operator between the values that the operator is going to be operate on. You put the operator after you specify what value it is supposed to be operating on. So to illustrate that concept, I think it's helpful to switch to the tablet so I can actually use this you know, to freeform, you know, kind of formulate the expressions. So I'll give you a kind of complex expression to begin with, do the translation, and then I'll show you how that happens, okay? Because I think once you understand how to mechanically translate from one to the other one, then you go like, oh, okay, so that's not really complicated, okay? So we go with uh, like x plus y, the whole thing times z, and then we add uh, w to the whole thing, and then we divide this by, mm, I don't know, you know, 2 plus uh, v, and then this whole thing times s, okay? I'm just making this unnecessarily difficult, okay? So first question, does everybody understand the way it is represented right now? We all good with this? Okay. So I'm going to do the translation right now to infix notate to uh, postfix notation. This is what we call infix notation because the operator is between the values that it is supposed to operate on, and therefore it is called the infix notation. So the postfix notation of this thing, so I have to kind of do this in my head, is x y plus z times w plus and then we have um, 2 v plus s times divide. Okay? Then you go like, I have no idea what, the, what this is. Okay? So let me go over this first, and then we'll, we're going to go over the mechanical method to come up with the postfix notation. Don't worry, most of the postfix notations that you guys will be dealing with would be like label 1 plus dot six plus, you know, that sort of thing, you're not going to see anything quite involved like this. Okay, so what happens is x, y are just values, okay? So by the time we get to the plus sign, it will add whatever x, y are, and it comes up as a sum. So that sum, okay, is going to be sitting on the stack somewhere, not our stack, but it's going to be a value stack, so it's going to sit there, and then we see a value of z, which is also going to be pushed on the stack. So by this time, we also have two values available. And then by the time we encounter the asterisk, which is multiplication, the multiplication operator is like, okay, do we have at least two values for me to multiply? Yep, we got those two values. So we will do the multi multiplication. The product of the multiplication is then pushed on the stack. So by the time we encounter the w, we would have two values on the stack because we have the product and the W on the stack. By the time we get to the plus sign, the plus sign is going to ask, do we have at least two things on the stack for me to add? Yes, we do, okay? So that's going to be um, basically the entire numerator of the division. Then we have the two, and then we have the V, which are all pushed on the value stack. So by the time we get to the plus, it is asking, what was the last two things that we have on the value stack? Oh, there's a V and there's a 2. Let's add them together, okay? Pop those two, add them together, and then push the sum back on the stack. So that means you know, by the time we process the plus, we will still have this entire thing sitting on the stack. But on the other hand, we have 2 plus V, 
you know, already as a single value. And then we have S also push on the stack. So by the time we have the multiplication, it would multiply S to the sum of V and two, which is the entire denominator. So by the time we are done with this multiplica multiplication operator, we, we would have two things sitting on the stack. We would have the entire numerator, which is this part here, and then and the entire uh, denominator, which is this part here sitting on the stack. So by the time we get to the slash, which is the divide operator, it is asking, hey, do we have at least two things sitting on the stack so I can do the divide? Yep. And therefore, it accomplishes the entire thing. So there's a mechanical way to do this, okay? I did this in my head because I'm, I have done this a long, for a long time. So the mechanical way to do this is to look at the, the infix notation as a tree, okay? So if you have not taken CISP 430, you know, the term tree is a little bit foreign, but it's just one way to represent the entire thing structurally. So we have a slash at the top because that's the last operation that we want to perform. What are we dividing? Well, uh, for the numerator, the last operation is a plus. The plus on one side has a W, and on the other side, it has a multiplication. The multiplication on one side has a Z. On the other side, it has a sum. The sum is between the X and the Y. Is that okay? That's everybody kind of see how this side here is corresponding to the numerator of the division, more or less. It's structurally, it is representing the uh, numerator. So on the other side, the last operation is a multiplication, which corresponds to this multiplication here. The multiplication has S on one side, and then on the other side, it is the sum between a two and a variable V. So that's the entire tree. Is that okay? Maybe, okay. Yes, go ahead. You can define any operator, you know, basically all operators that you are used to can also be turned into a postfix method. power, so it would be the base, and then the exponent, and then the power operator. But how would you do that? Um, okay, so let's take a look at that one. So if you have x to the power of y, then it is x, y, and then whatever operator corresponds to power. Oh, so just Well, it, there's no, uh, there's no symbol, you know, but even on your calculator, there's a key corresponding to power. So just imagine that key taking the place of the POW in the a, in a box. Yeah, it's just a token. You know, it's just that normally we don't have a symbol you know, representing to the power of because, because we use superscript. So the key to turn from infix to postfix notation is to traverse this particular tree in what we call a post-order traversal, which means you have a tendency to keep going until you get to the end. You cannot go any further. So when you cannot go any further, then you emit whatever symbol is at that point, then you go back up. But if whatever you go back up to, which is called the parent, if the parent has another child that is not explored, then you don't emit the operator itself, you go to the other child and you do the same thing. You go as far as, as, far as you can go. So Y is you know, basically what we call a leaf you know, because there are no nodes below that. So we emit X and then a Y. And then when we get back to X, then we emit X, I mean the plus, because at that point there are, there's no, there are no children of plus that are unexplored. When plus is emitted, it goes back to its own parent, which is the multiplication. But the multiplication has an unexplored child called Z, so we explore the Z first. The Z has no child, no children, so we emit the Z, and then we go, up, we go back up to the multiplication, and at that point, all the children of multiplication 
are emitted, so we emit the multiplication. Then we go back to the plus, but at this point, the plus has one side of the children already emitted, but the other side has not. So we go to the other child of the plus, which is W. We emit W because W has no children. Then we go back to the plus, and then at that point, the plus has all of these children already emitted, so we emit the plus, and then we go back to the multiplication, I mean the division. At that point, the right child of the division has not been explored. So we go to the right child of the division, we go to the multiplication. The multiplication has children, okay, and we always favor the left child first, okay? So we go to the plus, the plus also has its own left child, which is the two. The two has no children, so we emit the two, we go back to the plus. The plus has the right child still to be explored, so we explore the right child, which is the V, and then we go back to the plus. At that point, this plus has both children already explored, so we emit the plus, and then we go back to the multiply, multiplication. At that point, the multiplication still has the right child unexplored, so we go to the right child, explore that. S has no children, we emit the S, we go back to the multiplication, at that point, multiplication has no ch children unexplored. We emit the multiplication. And then finally, we go all the way back to the slash. And then at that point, the slash has no unexplored children. So we emit the multiplication, I mean the division, and we are done. So this is called a depth first search, you know, in uh, CISP 430. So that's one way to kind of generate the postfix notation. So once again, you will not have something this complicated, okay? You guys are gonna deal with, how do I translate, you know, some label L1 plus two? Oh, it's L1 two plus, okay? So are we okay so far with this? So I'm just giving you the method for the most general, you know, uh, problem to, to solve the most general problem, but typically you are just dealing with like three things. Yes? <clears throat> Hmm? This is infix, and this is the postfix equivalent of the infix notation. Yep. So why do you think this might actually be helpful? Because most of you are now thinking, this is some of those, you know, this is one of those really awkward things that Tech invents that is only useful in his class, just like the you know, TTP. I mean, TTP has my name on it, you know, so obviously it's not going to be useful anywhere else. So why do you think postfix notation, notation may actually be useful in your career? Yes? Okay, so why do you think postfix is neat? Yes? Mm-hmm. Well, yes, okay, so it, the computer has to use what we call a value stack in order to keep track of what values are computed, but we don't know what to do with it yet. Okay, so it does relate to the concept of a stack. So when you look at the, at the postfix notation, do you see any use of parentheses? It does not need parentheses. Parentheses have no use in this case because all the nesting is done by the concept of a stack. You can compute a whole bunch of stuff, and you go like, but I don't, I don't have to use it yet. That's okay, just leave it alone, okay? And therefore, we don't need the, the concept of parentheses. I know from your perspective, understanding the postfix notation takes a whole lot more effort compared to the infix notation for one simple reason, our minds have been poisoned by infix notation ever since elementary school. That is how we were taught how to express one plus two, okay? It's one plus two, not one, two plus, okay? That's the only reason why it is difficult for us to read postfix notation as opposed to the infix notation. It's like, oh yeah, I totally get what that is supposed to be doing, okay? But when you look at this from the perspective of a parser, which is you know, basically a specialized you know, computer program code 
to evaluate an expression, the postfix notation is far simpler to implement compared to the infix notation. Infix notation uh, parsing is actually quite difficult. Okay, you need to, you know, it's, it's just complicated. It's just a lot more complicated. Why is it more complicated? Because we have implicit operator priority. Multiplication has to take place first, and then you do the addition. So because of all those implicit rules, infix notation is actually much more difficult to parse compared to postfix notation. So you might ask, how much more complicated? Well, it is complicated enough that the early HP uh, calculators do not have resources to parse infix notation. They are programmable calculators, okay, HP 41, okay, the entire HP 41 you know, series of calculators are famous, okay, because, you know, if you ask, you know, your uncles or your parents, okay, who used to be an engineer or even a finance person, they would know what is an HP calculator. But HP calculators did not have the resources to handle parentheses, so they only use postfix notation. So the postfix notation is also known as RPN, which stands for reversed Polish notation. So if you know someone who is about my age or older, who used to be an engineer or an accountant or someone who, you know, who's in the finance you know, area, you can ask that person, did you use an HP calculator in your career? Yeah, yeah, those are pretty common. That's the only brand of calculator. So did you use RPN? Oh yeah, so how did you learn about RPN? That's kind of like my generation thing. How did you learn about it, okay? So I know some of you are now thinking, so you are now teaching us you know, some really archaic you know, thing because your know, resources were not available. So what is the context of learning postfix at this point? I'll give you three letters, PDF. You go like PDF, okay, Por portable document format from Adobe. What does that have anything to do with postfix notation? Well, PDF was derived from postscript, okay? Postscript, okay, I know most of you do not know that anymore, is a language from a computer to a printer. So many printers today are still postscript compatible because you know, some printer driver still want to output your postscript. So why do you think it is named postscript? Because it uses postfix notation. So postscript is a programming language. It is a full programming language. Most people did not know that. It's a full programming language. So instead of you know, sending out you know, zeros and ones, you know, of your know, dark pixel versus you know, no pixel, you know, on the on the piece of paper, it sends out commands to the printer. It says, "Hey, draw a circle over here, an arc over here. This line goes from here to here, uh, and we want these letters to be appearing over here." In other words, it is a program that you are sending from the computer to the printer. You can set up loops, okay? You can actually set up loops in PostScript and say, I want to draw a bunch of circles. They have the same center, and then the radius just kind of expands like this. You can program the entire thing. It is a programming language. But in that particular programming language, everything is expressed in a postfix notation. You specify the parameters, then you call. You specify the values, then you operate on them, and so on. So PDF is derived from PostScript, and PostScript itself uses postfix notation, which basically means if you ever have a need to generate or hand program to hand author a PDF document, you will need to know PostScript you know, or postfix notation. Does that kind of make sense or not? So why would you ever want to you know, hand code a PDF document. Yes? Well, there are certain times you want, let's say you want to uh, print out and encode it, okay. 
encoded disk, which is a very specific kind of thing that you want to print out. So you can try to you know, kind of use a program to, you know, to specify that thing, but it's not going to be very exact. But if you can write a program to say, I need each arc to be exactly from here to here, and I need the radius exactly to be this long, and I, I need these two circles to be spaced out by exactly this much, it's easier to write that program than to try to find a program to draw whatever you need to draw. So that means, you know, programmatically writing your PDF can have certain advantages because you have 100% control over the actual position of all the things that you want, be, you, you want to be on that piece of paper. Okay, so I know it seems far-fetched, but, you know, in my career as a you know, in robotic design and whatnot, I have found that this is actually really handy sometimes to be able to hand code the PDF so I know exactly what it is going to print. So anyway, getting back to um, our, I digressed quite a bit, okay, but okay, where is my, <laughs> I need to go find, right, right there, okay. So postfix notation is one, and then the second question is, what is the dot? So a postfix expression may use a dot to refer to the current location. That's all it says, okay? So what exactly is the current position? So in this case, on line two, the dot of the dot six plus refers to the address of the opcode of LDI, okay? So now you ask, so that means the expression is really specifying six bytes or six locations after the opcode of the LDI. Where do you think that is? Let's do some counting. So this particular instruction needs two bytes because you need one opcode for the LDI and then the second byte is the, the result of the evaluation of that expression. So you have dot plus zero, dot plus one, dot plus two, dot plus three, dot plus four, dot plus five, dot plus six. Dot plus six refers to the address of the halt instruction. But isn't that where we want the function to return to? The callee is supposed to return to the halt instruction? Yep. So that's another way to specify the return address without having to define a label. Is that okay so far? Okay. So when we assemble the program, you know, we'll get to do, we'll go to the assemble view and it will be pretty clear how this works. Yes. The dot is referring to the address of the opcode on that same line. So since the dot is on line two, um, it is referring to the, op, the address of the opcode of the LDI instruction. Six, not six. You know, right now, um, the dot itself on line two is basically one because no op takes location zero, so the LDI is going to take location one. And the dot is referring to the address of the opcode, so that's one. So the dot six plus gives you an answer of seven. The question is, what is at location seven? Well, according to my counting, location seven is the halt instruction, which is exactly where the function is supposed to return to. Yeah. That is correct. <laughs> but typically, because the uh, return address is the last thing that you push on the stack, and then you have to do the unconditional branch to the entry point of the function right away. So these instructions tend to bunch together like this. You seldom have any need to insert additional code in between. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Go ahead. Because later on we push it on the stack. Because line three and four combined is a push, so we are pushing whatever A has, which is the return address, on the stack. 
well, that that helps. Okay, that helps to remember where the function, where the callee is supposed to return to, right? And then I go to main because I'm treating main as a function now. It has to return. So lines two to line four is simply setting up the return address so that main now as a callee knows where to return to. So that means the first thing I need to do is to go to main and go like, okay, since you are now a regular function, you have to return. So the code to return to the caller is LD choose you know, B or C, okay? So B is fine, increment D, and then JMPB. I mean, these three instructions is combined is return. You know, we have talked about this uh, last Thursday as well as this Tuesday, okay? So this is all, hopefully this is something that you will start to remember. All right, so now that we are in main, now we want to take a look at main and go like, okay, this main is not simple because we have local variables. So that means I have to allocate the space for the local variables. So now I have to look at this and go like, okay, what is on the stack? Well, the first thing on the stack is the return address because main is now just a regular you know, function. And then we need to allocate for x and y as local variables. So we can allocate y and then we can allocate x. So all of these are going to be on the stack. This is how we want it to look like, but at this point, only return address is pushed. So I need to reserve the space for local variables x and y, and also to deallocate it later. So, but before we do th anything like this, okay, because I can do this, okay, don't copy this. I can just use two decrement D to reserve the space for local variable x and y, and then I use increment D, increment D later on to deallocate th those two bytes on the stack. That's one way to do it. I don't like to do it that way. So instead of doing this, I want to know what is on the stack, and as a result, you know, I can define labels as offsets to those items on the stack. Yes? Why am I putting? Because where are they gonna live? The local variables need a space to live. In other words, they need to consume some memory. So where am I gonna allocate the memory for local variables? I cannot allocate it statically because you know, that is not gonna work for recursion. Because the recursion has a function calling itself. If there's only one fixed location for each local variable, then all the recursive calls will be sharing one single space for each local variable, which is not gonna work. So the only other way to allocate space is to use the stack. So the stack is now not only used to store the return address, which is pushed by the caller, but it is also used to store the local variables. Yes? Yes. So the compiler is going to, so in, in the C code, from the compiler's perspective, it will actually keep track of how many bytes are needed for the local variables. So when the compiler generates the assembly code, it knows how to set up the stack, which is exactly what I'm trying to do here, which is doing it manually. Is that okay? All right, so once I'm, I set up the entire stack, I want this to be the last thing allocated, so I want register D or the stack pointer to be pointing there. And then uh, the next location, you know, this is basically at the location of D plus one. This is at location D plus two, but I really don't need to kind of think too much about it, okay? All right, so what I do is I use um, a label, main X, to represent the offset to local variable x from where the stack pointer points to. So in this case, it is a zero. Main y is the number of bytes uh, from where the stack pointer points to to get to local variable y. So I could have just say one here, but I'm gonna do it you know, the proper way. In other words, I am basically saying, hey, start with where x is, and this is one byte 
above it, so just add one to it. So everything is relative to each other. Um, and then the return address is something that I don't have to deal with. So now I can have your know, main, I call it LVS, local variable size. In other words, altogether, how many bytes of, lo of local variables do I need? Well, that is just the offset to the last local variable plus the size of the last local variable. So now I have all the labels that I need to do a bunch of stuff, and I don't have to worry about counting the number of bytes on the stack anymore, because now I have labels to tell me where to find each one. Yes? Local variable size. It's just an acronym. Mm -hmm. All right, yes? So on line 14, what the assembler is gonna do is to say, every time I see main underscore X, I will just say it is zero. And then line 15 is saying, every time I see main underscore Y, and it will do the math, right? Because main X is a zero, zero plus one is one. So main Y is nothing more than a symbolic name for one. And then main LVS is nothing more than a symbolic name of two from the assembler's perspective. Yes? It does not. So you're asking you know, uh, the differentiation between a colon, a, a label definition with just a colon without an expression to the right-hand side versus a label definition with a, an expression to the right-hand side. Is that what you're asking? Okay. So a typical label, okay, so let's say we want to define a label here you know, that says main returns here, okay? Is that the kind of label that you're comparing to? Well, this is really the shorthand of this because we are defining this label to be what, wherever that location is. So the dot is actually just you know, saying, oh, okay, you want the label to be defined to be the current location, which you can. In fact, you know, the, the syntax highlighting is not working, but it really should, you know, but I did not program it to recognize that, unfortunately. So that's why I cannot do it. Yep. Uh, no, no, it, because the compiler, the assembler, when it's assembling, it keeps track of where the next location is all the time. So when you have a label definition, which is a label name with a colon with nothing after that, it automatically assumes, oh, you just want to remember where we are at this point. That's basically what the assembler is trying to do. Line 15, well, lines 15, 16, and 17, they can appear anywhere within the file because you know, the, the resolution of the labels can be done you know, top down or bottom up. You know, it, so it, it, there's no restriction of you have to define a label before you refer to it. No. I mean, you mean line 15 itself has to be all in one line. That is correct. Say that one more time. <laughs> that would not work. That would be a syntax error because you know, that's not how labels can be defined. Okay. All right, so looks like we have some questions about how this is gonna work. So we, I'm just gonna run it, okay? You know, this code will run even though main doesn't do a single thing. So let's go ahead and run it. And to do that, I have to go back to where my um, river spider is installed. So I did send an announcement, okay? It is a good time to install it, okay? Just to make sure that you have that up, you know, available. So let's go ahead and assemble and try to run it. And I need to go find the assembler 
tab. And then just put it into oh, drag drop. There we go. Nope. One more time. Drag and drop. There we go. All right. So it is still working on it. Actually, it's done already. All right. So this is the actual you know, trace of the execution of that code. But what we have. Oh, okay. In the assemble view, this will give you an idea of what the compiler or what the assembler did. So um, this label is not used, okay? Main returns here is a label. It is defined, but it's not used in any way. The other three labels, okay? Main X, main Y, and main LVS, and also main itself. So main is used, you know, main is basically the same thing as 0.8. So the way you can find out exactly what each label resolves to is something that we talked about already. You can go to a tab that says sim tab, which is the short name of symbol table. So sim tab consists of one cell that is in JSON notation, a, a JavaScript object notation. So it's a little bit awkward, okay? But when you read this, you can see main returns here and when you look at the RPN, that is the value of the label. In other words, main returns here is defined to be seven. So let's look up main X, okay? This is where main X is. Main X is defined to be one. Um, no, I take it back, different line, zero. Main Y is one, and then main LVS is two. So that's one single place where you can find all the definitions. Yep. Um, because there are different labels. Main returns here is, because when you look at the actual source, okay, which is, uh, okay, this is close enough to the source. Okay, this is, what, this is where main returns here is defined. It is the address of the halt instruction, which is at location 07. Main, on the other hand, is here. So it picks up the address of the first opcode of you know, right after the label definition. But main X, main Y, and main LVS have specific expressions to the right-hand side of the colon. So they are defined to be whatever those expressions resolve to. Are we still doing okay? Reversed Polish notation, which I believe we talked about uh, about 20 minutes ago. Reversed Polish notation. All right, so shall we move on? Okay, so this code does work, okay? This code is basically the same basic code that we have been talking about since last Thursday, because I have not allocated any space yet on the stack for the local variables. Looking at the time, we have enough time to finish this. So now that we have these labels, the label definitions do not affect the uh, stack pointer at all. Label definitions is a construct of the assembler. It has no impact whatsoever to the runtime behavior unless you have an opcode that refers to a label. So right now, you can see the labels are defined, but who is referring to main X, main Y, and a main LVS? Nobody, right? So that means the entire program does not understand um, just a normal function. Main is a normal function. It doesn't know how to allocate for the local variables, and it doesn't know how to deallocate for the local variables. So to allocate, this is the way we're going to do it. We say LDI A with main LVS. So A is now the number of bytes I need to reserve on the stack for the local variables X and Y. And then what I need to do is to take this much away from the stack pointer so I can do a subtraction and subtract that much from the stack pointer. But whenever you allocate something on the stack, you have to automatically ask the question, when should I deallocate it? 
Okay, so that's kind of like the, the, the mentality of every time you have an open paren, you have to think about where am I supposed to put the closed paren of this open paren? So the way I do things is I put it right away here. So I have LDIA with main LVS and then do an add DA right away. So this way, you know, when I'm in the code in between, I don't have to worry about, okay, I have to remind myself to close or to deallocate the local variables. So that's just my habit of doing things. Whenever I open a curly brace in C or C++ programming, I put in the close automatically. And then I just insert between the open and the close because this way I don't have to remember to close the open your brace later on. It will feel really awkward the first time you do programming this way, you know, but when you're used to it, it's actually not a bad way. And I think you guys may not need to do this just because you know, the fancy editors that you guys use would automatically put in the close when you open something. So that's a, that's a tool kind of issue, yep. Yes, because when you're about to leave the function, the local variables do not serve any purpose anymore. So at that point, it is safe to deallocate the local variables. Very good. All right, so now we have to kind of check out what am I supposed to do here? Well, I need to put a five into local variable X. So now the question is, uh, how do we do this? <clears throat> well. In order to put something into local variable five, I mean, local variable X, you have to find it first. In other words, you have to find the address of local variable X first. So the way we do it, or the way I recommend doing it, is to say, let's put the offset of local variable X into a register, we'll just call it B. You can use A, you can use B, you can use C, okay? It doesn't matter which register you use. But all this is, is really the address of X minus whatever the stack pointer has. Okay, so this is really, really important. You know, what, um, okay. What register B has at this point is the address of the local variable minus the stack pointer. In other words, it is an offset from where the stack pointer points to, to the address of X. It floats with the stack pointer. Everything is referencing the stack pointer. It's like, hey, stack pointer, where are you pointing? I'm pointing here. Okay, so once I know where the stack pointer points to, I can now locate everybody else. Okay, the best analogy I can think of is a caravan. Okay, so let's just say that this class is going on a, on a trip and we are doing a caravan. And I am the person with a GPS, so Amazon always knows where to deliver stuff to me because I'm the one with the GPS, okay? So when I order things, okay, I just tell, you know, Amazon is like, okay, this is my uh, GPS tag, deliver over here. And then Amazon would do its magic thing and deliver the, the package to my, you know, to my, to my car, okay? So let's just say that Sam is the car behind me and he wants to order something, okay? And then Sam goes like, well, but I don't want to walk to tax car to pick up my stuff. So what do you do? When you order something to, from Amazon, you tell Amazon that I'm one car behind this GPS tag, which is my GPS tag. Is that okay? And then let's say, you know, Julia is behind you know, Sam, and you go like, I want to order something too, but I don't want you guys to open up my package. I want it to be delivered to my car, okay? I don't trust you guys with my package, okay? So what do you do? Well, you don't say you're one car behind Sam, you say you're two cars behind tax car. So you basically specify this is tax GPS tag, and I'm two cars behind it. Is that okay? So would this method work when I go, when we go camping at the um, Sequoia Park National Park in a campsite? Yeah, sure, as long as we maintain that order, right? Sam has to be the car behind me and Julia is the car behind Sam, right? So what if we say, we are tired of looking at the Sequoia trees, they don't move, it's kind of boring. And uh, 
I think we want to get sushi, and I heard you know Los Angeles have really good sushi. So now we drive you know the cars to Los Angeles, and then we park the cars in the parking lot, in the same order. Okay. So do you think you know Amazon can still deliver the stuff using this method? Yes, because as long as they can find me, which is where the stack pointer points to, they can find everything else that is only relative to where the stack pointer points to. Local variables are only relative to where the stack pointer points to. Parameters are only relative to where the stack pointer points to. Even the return address is only relative to where the stack pointer points to. Is that okay? So, yes. Uh huh. In the same invocation of the function, yes. So that's a very specific thing. Okay, so so the next line here is going to compute the address of x. So let's see how. Okay, I'm going to write the comments first, and then we'll go back and figure out how to do that. Okay, because eventually I want this to be in B at this point. Okay, so how do I get the address of x in register B when it is currently whatever is whatever x is minus the stack pointer? Okay, so this is algebra time. Add the stack pointer to it, right? So if I'm adding something to something, which instruction do you think I should use? Yes, that's kind of obvious, right? Okay. So that means I need to add instruction here. B is the one being changed. So the question is, what do I put here? Well, let's see. This is going to be the address of x minus sp, which is what is currently in register B. I just have to add the stack pointer to the whole thing. So I need to add the stack pointer to B here. So what should I specify at the blinky cursor? D, that's right. OK, because we have chosen register D to be the stack corner. Are we good so far? All right. So, but if you look at the code here, uh, we need to store a 5 to x, okay? So I need another register to store the 5, stba. So that's going to finish x equals to 5. Does that make sense to you? Because what is in register B by the time we get to line 26? What is in register B is the address of x. But the B, register B, is, is used in indirect mode. So that means we are dereferencing whatever B, is, B has, which is basically dereference, you know, the asterisk operator. So the address of, and then outside we have dereference, they cancel out each other, so we only get x back. And that's why this is how we store the 5 to x as a local variable. Are we still doing OK so far with this? Yes? Yes. Yes, because the main x is nothing more than the offset. It is like, how many bytes are you away from where the stack pointer is pointing to? So we are treating the stack pointer as an anchor point of this is a reference point, okay? Everything is relative to this reference point. Yes? Main X is not an address, it is an offset. So in the analogy, you know, Sam's, you know, quote unquote, you know, label is one because he's one card behind me. And then Julia's is two because she's two, two cards behind me. So it's just an offset from the reference point because I am the reference point. I'm the person with an actual GPS that's registered with Amazon. So, you know, if you guys have my GPS tag and you can say two cars behind that car, Amazon knows which car to deliver the package to. So, 
No, main X as a label is simply an offset so that I don't have to keep remembering, oh, X is exactly where the stack pointer points to, Y is one byte after that. So with all the label definitions, I don't need to know where they are exactly anymore because I can just refer to the label name. It's basically putting a zero into B. But I don't know whether you know the label is going to be zero or not, right? You know, because your know, Y is not at zero from where the stack pointer points to. So I'm going to run this program right now because it's runnable and I can double check to see whether X is in fact getting the value of five or not. Okay. But the key to do this is you have to have a map of what is on the stack and where is what on the stack when you execute the code. So we are going to take a look at that map. <clears throat> okay, come on, switch to the next page and the next page. There we go. So we are looking at the stack. The stack has the highest location being FF, the next location being FE, the next location being FD, the next location being FC, and so on. Okay, I think we have enough bytes in that. The highest byte, the first thing we push on the stack in this program is the return address so the main can go back to that code that has no name. Is that okay? So we have some kind of a return address at this location. And then we decrement the stack pointer by two because there are two local variables. Okay, so the stack pointer initially, in the end, will end up pointing here. And we claim that this is X, and we claim that this is Y. Okay? Because when the stack pointer is FD, it is pointing to the last thing that I allocated, which is local variable X. We still doing okay so far? Maybe? Yes. Huh? Because there are two local variables, each one takes one byte, so we have a total of two bytes worth of local variables. Huh? If there are more local variables, then you have to decrement you know, the stack pointer further in order to allocate enough space for all your local variables. So in the end, I think this location, location FD, should end up with a value of five. Okay, so I think this is what the program should do. And now I can double check. So we'll, we'll keep this screen <clears throat> when I run the code. Oh, okay. This doesn't work well because you know, when I move the cursor, you know, it automatically switches the screen too. So we'll just go ahead and rerun the code. And then we can switch to, oh, okay, too far. The trace, okay, so the trace takes a while, you know, because it's still working. So we go to analysis. And, okay, it's supposed to be done by now. But it didn't do what I thought it would because I think I forgot to save the file. Okay, we'll double check. Save. Okay, it is now saved. And run it again. So this is why I think it is important for you, all of you to install River Spider because you, know, you can replicate the experiment. We can also change the programs and go like, okay, what if I do blah, 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 okay? And this is what you can do to visualize what's going to happen to the memory locations in, and what is in the register and so on and so forth. And then you can comment, you know, in the trace itself, what is that instruction doing in the execution of the program? So let's go back here. Yes, so it does work here because I can see that location FD is getting a value of five. Just as expected. Yep. Their general purpose. Register A is a general purpose until you get to the return statement. 
So when you're not executing a return statement or you're not at the point when a function returns, register A is a general purpose register just like B and C. They're all quote unquote interchangeable. because I need to compute the address. And I don't know, I don't really want to know what the, how the labels are defined, because that's the whole purpose of defining the labels, because now I can use the same strategy to compute the address of Y, and so on. So if, if A0 is... It is not, because it just so happens that the stack pointer is pointing directly at local variable X in this case. But local variable Y is not where the stack pointer points to. So why not just do LVI and the Because we don't know how the variables are going to be allocated. Because local variable X may not be the first one. I can, I'm, at a later point in time, I may say, oh, you know what? I need local variable W also to be defined. So that's going to offset you know, the address of all the local variables. So I don't want to have to rely on my mind to remember X is where the stack pointer points to, Y is one byte after that, and so on. So I want a label to define you know, the offsets so I don't have to remember the actual you know, uh, offsets. I can, I can use a symbolic name to help me remember which one is which one. All right, so we don't have you know, a whole lot of time, so what I'm going to do is to finish this program, and then we'll come back and revisit this program next Tuesday, which I think is a good thing to do because it gives you the weekend to explore this program and try to explain things away. So, so I'm not going to go through a whole lot of explanation except to talk to myself. Um, so I need to get to the address of X and then push it on the stack. And then I need to push the return address on the stack too. And then do an unconditional branch to increment, which is my uh, function. When it returns, we have one extra thing sitting on the stack, which is the argument. So we need to get rid of the argument. And now register A has the return value of ink. I need to store that register A to wherever Y is. So I need to first compute the address of Y using any register other than A, so B. And then store the... Uh, return value to wherever B is pointing to, because B is now the address of Y. And now I need to go back and in, in, implement uh, ink. So this is ink. So ink is kind of interesting, because it has a parameter, then it has a return address on the stack, and then it has its own local variable like this. When the stack is all set up, I need register D to be pointing to the last thing that I allocate on the stack, which is the old value. So in terms of the label definition, O value is going to be the first thing you know, that the stack pointer points to. The return address, um, okay, so that's the only local variable. So LVS is ink old value one plus. And then the uh, parameter P is found right after the, uh, how should I put it? It's basically right at this location. So, uh, one plus, there we go, okay. Because it, it's uh, it's right after the return address. So that's why it is a one plus compared to LVS of ink. So I do the same thing here, okay. I typically just do the return code right away, which is LDBD, increment D, JMPB. But I also need to allocate and deallocate for the local variables. So that's LDIA, oh, I cannot use A, let's, so let's use B, uh, ink LVS, uh, I need to do a subtraction first to allocate, oh, the other way around, and then to deallocate, I need to add the same amount so that we are deallocating that portion from the stack. 
So now we can actually implement whatever is in between. LDI A uh, ink P, that's the offset to P, that's the address of P, that's actually P, and that is what P points to. And then on the other side, we need to store this into old value. So ink old value, that's the offset, that's the address, and now we can store two um, old value. And then we need to increment whatever P is pointing to. So that's a LDI A with uh, ink P. This is the offset. This is the address. This is P. And this is what P points to, which is what I need to increment. And then store back to wherever that I got it. So that's the increment of um, whatever P points to. And now I just have to return old value. So I need to get to the offset of old value, get to the address of old value, get to old value, and that's the return value. Put it into register A, I should be all set. All right, so I'm, the chances of this working is about I would say 20% <laughs> because I, I actually just, I was talking and doing it at the same time. Yep. Yeah. But you cannot do it because the value of the register is not run t is not assembled time determined. The value of a register changes when the code executes. So you don't know what D is supposed to be at the time that you specify we need to add register D to this thing. So you are correct. That would have made things a little bit more efficient. So now we want to see if this code works or not by looking at the updates of the variables. So we can see how the six is stored to FD, and can anyone remember where FD is? FD is local, is local variable X, so that's correct, okay? We also want to know what is local variable Y. Local variable Y is FD, is supposed to get a value of five, we got that. The stack pointer is balanced, and then we get to the very, you know, the, the, the end of the execution, which is the halt instruction. So the program does work the first time. So what I'll do next, okay, so for those of you who want to kind of study this program, it is handy to take a snapshot of this, of this you know, Google Sheets right now because the code is in the source tab and then the trace is already in the analysis tab. I will also you know, zip up the .c file as well as the .tpsm file and send it to you by announcement so over the weekend, okay, it would be a great idea to kind of go over this particular program, at least to understand up to the, the last point where I really go line by line to explain things, and then see if you can go a little bit further and explain the rest of the program, which I have not explained line by line. Because you have enough information, you know, there's enough information already. It's just a matter of connecting all of those concepts and information in order to explain the program. And that would be a great way to study for this class. Um, I need to give you the access code of today's lab. There is a lab today. And let me see, where is it? Right here. All right, so tonight's lab has a access code of framed. So it's lowercase framed, you know, passive. And I'll see you guys over at the lab.